a desert, smoke, uh, oil burning. And but there are people who believe that this is the, uh, you know, and I, I may be one of them, I'm coming around to it. But here's a, uh, this is Revelation 9, and uh, there's a fifth angel talking here. And then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven under the earth. I believe I'd be a scud. <laughs> Uh, it gets worse, it gets weirder. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose smoke out of the pit. There's the oil fired. And as a smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them were given power. As, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the real, which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. I don't think I have to explain that. Everybody's looking for God on their side these days. And, uh, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment, I marked this all up so I can't really read it, and their, their, torment, their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man, and in those days shall, man, shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. Boom. And it goes on. Uh, the book of Revelation is one of the few things in any writing that I utterly defer to. It's one of the great pieces of pure writing, pure work. Uh, you don't have to be uh, religious to appreciate it. This is really a firestorm. But uh, it becomes something else when you uh, take it quite seriously. And, uh, well, are we prepared for the end of the world? Is this, you know, for Armageddon? I am. I've been waiting for it for a long time. The apocalypse. Are you okay? Are you people, uh, is that acceptable? The end? This is, there are uh, seven angels at least. That was just one of them. Torment, scorpions, uh, and the others bring uh, rivers of blood, uh, horsemen of death. It actually is a pretty good scenario for what's happening now. And uh, I'm, I'm at peace with it. But maybe we should start and have a little talk here as to, uh, am I way off base here in believing that uh, the only explanation for this war may be in the book of Revelation? Or is there a more logical, uh, political, and uh, contemporary solution or understanding of this? Who, who would like to... Uh, Well, I uh, I wouldn't have said that, you know, six months ago, but it's uh, hard to argue with the uh, terms when you see Armageddon here, and uh, there's, there's a whole school of thought that says that this is that. And uh, Jesus writes, we have the, the bear, the eagle, the beast, and the, the desert, the smoke. And uh, there will be the end of the world at some point. This may be, uh, I don't know. I guess it's my inability to grasp why we're, we've committed our entire uh, national might and uh, credibility, really. Uh, it's gonna get nasty. Well, so far, I think we've, I don't know how many casualties, but we've, we've they've all been uh, friendly fire. Yeah, the Iraqis have a, what, a million man army burrowed down there like fire ants. And we uh, really haven't faced them yet. And we've killed, uh, I guess, is that true? All friendly fire? <laughs> well, I, I don't think there are any, uh, yeah. I'm not, uh, there's something wrong with it. Except that uh, if we view it as uh, the apocalypse, I don't believe that necessarily. I'm, I'm kind of reaching for an answer. Well, how do you feel about it? It's all well and right. <laughs> It'd be like Nixon being right, finally. I don't know, what if uh, four horsemen appear in the desert and ride across?
box toward our troops. Uh, I hear a lot of people who believe uh, the scripture while they're fighting. That's a lot of uh, soldiers. <laughs> Well, we'd hope, I, I would hope so. It would seem that, uh, yeah, if we are number one, uh, you know, the most powerful nation uh, on the earth in history, uh, we really shouldn't be at the uh, mercy of uh, any you know, two-bit fanatic who uh, wants to annex, uh, you know, the, the 19th province. That was sort of a... Uh, a, a debt, you know, a financial argument. Uh, I'm, there was no real... Well, uh, Kuwait was created, I think, in 1945 by a British diplomat who just drew a line over there and took all the uh, oil fields and and the port. And uh, the Kuwait, uh, the Emir and his people, the royal family, are among the worst swine in the world. And one of the problems they have now is that uh, in Cairo and Alexandria, the uh, Kuwaiti royal family is whooping it up in discos, and uh, it's one of the, uh, you know, it's kind of uh, embarrassing for them. They're trying to keep keep these people from uh, making this display of uh, berserk uh, dumb wealth. And uh, yeah, it was an argument, uh, I think uh, Saddam, uh, or somebody in Red Rock figured that the Kuwaitis were drilling, at angle drilling like they do in Texas and Oklahoma, where you uh, buy a worthless plot right next to a, you know, an oil field and then drill sideways. I don't know. And Goethe did not pay their fair share of the war with Iran. It was a simple squabble, like a, you know, a collection agency or something. <laughs> well, a Bush was out there and it happened uh, right next door to me. Uh, Bush and uh, Margaret Thatcher were uh, vacationing, they said, in Woody Creek. <laughs> that was bad enough. Uh, believe me, when George Bush and, Mar and Maggie Thatcher come to your neighborhood, it really does uh, turn things upside down. Roadblocks, people with black uh, hoods on, sniper teams, uh, secret service everywhere. You can't get from point A to point B. <laughs> the Woody Creek Tavern became uh, uh, sort of headquarters, a command post for the Secret Service. When everybody, had, everybody was armed in there. Uh, all of a sudden, well, it was kind of a peaceful vacation. Uh, the, our ambassador to uh, the Court of St. James lives down the road from me, along with Don Henley and Don Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had, uh, I have, I've had a long history of. Uh, well, the Secret Service and I have learned to get along. <laughs> uh, yeah, the last time I had to run in with them was uh, oh, two or three years ago when I was in uh, Milwaukee. And uh, as a Catholic Marquette University, went to a Jesuit, a Catholic gentleman who were into guilt and uh, I wanted to talk about guilt and uh, politics, and I was trying to think what to, how to attack uh, that, that mix, and I, it came to me that, well, all right, it was during the Iran-Contra uh, hearings, I said, all right, well, here we go, uh, we get guilt and politics. Uh, George Bush is the guiltiest man in politics, period. And I, he's so guilty, in fact, in this Iran-Contra business, that if you people believe in guilt, uh, as I do, I'm just a old building, but uh, I understand you, you know, send a Jesuit up here, we'll talk about guilt. And we go for a vote as to whether uh, uh, Bush was guilty, and guilty enough to, I, I said he was so guilty that if he were here in that room, that if he came up on the stage, that if they believed in their, Je their Jesuit sense of uh, inevitable guilt and retribution, that they would be forced to come up on the stage and stomp him to death. Uh, <laughs> if they believed in their principles. And uh, there was kind of ripple in the room. And I, uh, and I called for a vote, and it was two to one that they would if George Bush were there. 
<laughs> yeah, well, oh, oh, if the Secret Service is here now, let me tell you that uh, threatening the life of the Vice President uh, is, is one five-year felony, and inciting others to do so is another five-year felony. <laughs> and uh, the next day's paper in Milwaukee uh, had big headlines saying that I was urging mobs to stop the President, uh, Vice President, from death. All in fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, meanwhile, I was applying for credentials to go cover the Iran Contra hearing. And I was about to go to Washington. And I hadn't got the credentials yet. I, but I've had credentials for all my other things over the years. So I really wouldn't pay much. I was already going to take off for Washington. I thought, well, I'll just get the credentials when I get there. Don't worry about it. And uh, they were on my answering machine. There were constant messages from it. Secret Service. And I just thought it had to do with my credentials. You know, uh, they were calling me to say they're ready. You know, I had applied. Yeah, doctor, we have your credentials. I'll be there. So I didn't pay much attention to it until they got pretty urgent. I finally called the guy in Denver in the Secret Service office. And I uh, said, hurry, hurry, let's be quick with this. Uh, I'm calling you back. Uh, thank you very much. But I've got to leave for Washington to cover the hearings. And, uh, What's on your mind? Uh, and the guy said, uh, well, Mr. Thompson, uh, if you go to Washington without talking to me first, the rest of your life is going to be a series of terrible misunderstandings. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it turned out that the uh, uh, federal attorney in, uh, in Milwaukee had prepared uh, indictments, hadn't filed them. 10 years, and they, uh, I had to wait. The guy came out and uh, spoke to me. We had a nice talk, and I had to explain that, uh, well, I, I had to ask him, uh, well, you know, he understood after a while, it was funny, but I had to ask him, uh, well, you know, I do this, uh, this is my business, you know, uh, not threatening the life of the president, but this kind of commentary, you know, and Bush is guilty. I, I, I insisted on that, he didn't care. Uh, he was about to retire, so I said, well, uh, what, what, uh, and you, I could say that the president should be tarred and feathered, that's okay, but if I say he should, he should be hung, that's, uh, that's wrong, uh, a threat on the, uh, on a different law that protects the president, the vice president. But tart and feather is okay. Uh, I'm a flogged into a coma. I don't know. <laughs> uh, well, they, they're very specific about it. We, we parted good friends, but I, uh, I haven't been covering any campaigns recently. I'm, boy, I really hate that dread covering the next one, but I've, I've talked too much here. Let's uh, have a little... It's a dreary... Uh, well, I mean, I'll finish that story about Winnie Creek. Uh, here, George and Maggie came in. And we have a sort of a live and let live philosophy out there. Uh, it frequently results in problems. <laughs> but uh, it was, it's kind of interesting that they could come and go. And uh, the Secret Service, uh, I, I took all my rifles and the machine guns and things like that off the rack so they could see as they come in the door. They didn't even come to the house. They didn't, uh, they were peaceful enough that you know, I was there, so what? But boy, after about two days, all of a sudden, uh, the, uh, this uh, swine invaded uh, Kuwait, which uh, sounded to me like something that the Huckleaps would do in the Philippines. Uh, I wasn't would, prepared for this uh, armada of uh, armored cars and uh, red eruption of. Uh, that was like uh, one of Hitler's caravans on the way to uh, one of the President Garden or whatever the, his home. It came speeding out, out of uh, Lee Greek on the way to the airport. Silver planes came in and were all kind of squawking. Uh, some fool blew up some dynamite on a hill somewhere near town. And they had helicopters, you know, teams attacked him. And we suddenly went to war. And uh, ever since then, it's been kind of strange. And, uh, Apparently he uh, knew. They're right a week ahead of time. No. I don't know why we'd go to Woody Creek.
to announce that he was going to war against this uh, Saddam. And one little note about Saddam is interesting. He was in high school. He was uh, at the bottom of his class. He was considered an imbecile, too dumb to uh, walk around. But he was also president of his class. <laughs> I'm not sure what to make of him, but I did hear on the first night after he bombed him, when his first, did anybody hear the first statement, the full text of his first statement uh, after he'd been bombed all night? Well, uh, I think Peter Burnett got it out. And it was uh, a very concise uh, rant of about, uh, about 15 minutes. I wondered what the hell this guy is about and why uh, this was happening. I, I couldn't quite figure out who we were dealing with, but boy, he cleared that up real fast. Uh, here's a guy who had been clearly, he was in a rage, a uh, religious fanatic in a rage. He'd been somewhere in a bunker, bombed all night, all of his, you know, his country torn apart. And uh, they were, you know, people were asking, we were asking each other in general, uh, will he surrender? You know, will he go belly up? Here came a goddamn uh, Wolverine on the air uh, talking about, uh, well, he first he was going to cut the head off uh, Bush, the devil. And he was going to get King Fod of uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, rip him to shreds with a flay, you know, rip his skin off. And all the Jews would go, everything on Israel would be out. Uh, there was no doubt in his mind that this outrageous assault on his country was, uh, you know, as if something from the devil, exactly, the, the devil. And uh, no doubt in his mind that he, he not only was he, was he gonna fight it to the death, but he uh, had to. And uh, anybody who believed in uh, God and right would fight with him. And I think he still believes that. But boy, it was a scary thing. I thought we were dealing with a flake. You know, uh, so, you know, an ambitious politician, not at all, he may be a, yeah, he's ambitious, but this is a uh, this is like the Ayatollah, and uh, I don't know. There are very easier ways to get by in this world than to jump into Muslim wars. And I'm troubled by it. And who asked if we had no choice? Well, what does it matter if we have no choice? But to get bogged down in a hundred year bayonet war in the, the desert, uh, right, the Persian Gulf is already gone, right? It's a smoking ruin, an oil slick. Uh, well, at least starts putting prisoners up uh, on spikes, you know, burning them, setting heads back in uh, packages to the uh, hometown. Yeah, we're dealing with a person who has not the slightest intention of uh, quitting this and cannot see, uh, I don't know, it'd be uh, the equivalent of my, uh, people wondering if I was going to uh, abandon all hope, stop drinking, give up everything, turn into a, uh, even a person like Jerry Falwell, or who's that, Jerry, Jerry, uh, uh, the, the guy down in, uh, Louisiana, Swagger. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, what do you think of the press coverage of the war? Well, there is no press coverage of the war, really, except out of Baghdad. Uh, people ask me why I'm not over to cover the war. <laughs> well, I don't think I have no uh, ambition to spend the next six months or six years uh, in a tent. Uh, <laughs> With no beer. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can't speak. You speak to a woman, you either get kicked out of the country or uh, put in a uh, Saudi jail. Uh, to drink anything at all, you know, the soldiers can't even drink. What a nightmare that has to be. So I sit there in the desert and have to drink uh, Coca-Cola constantly and uh, worry about uh, nerve gas. What's the difference in being in? Baghdad and being in Saigon? Well, we have to take Baghdad separately from Saudi Arabia because the press corps, uh, which is huge, of course, uh, 
American, the world press is in Saudi Arabia, and they're limited to briefings and their rules. And if you step out out of the uh, line, we're all guests over there of the Saudis. So uh, we saw what happened to Bob Simon from CBS. He wandered off uh, the uh, straight and narrow and disappeared in the desert. And they say that the Iraqis uh, have them, uh, the CBS crew, but I believe that we have them. I think that the, yeah, the, green bird, the seals took them away. <laughs> No, you can't, uh, all you're gonna do, it's very frustrating to do that. I, I, I ran into it, I came from Saigon, in terms of war coverage, and I saw it in Grenada, Grenada the first, when they decided they had their old new rules for coverage. And uh, they decided that uh, press coverage, uh, loose lips, sink ships, that sort of thing. And there is no coverage, you have to wait. And uh, the generals were very few. And there is an argument, I guess, that uh, you can't conduct a war if uh, everybody knows what missile has uh, just come in. But out of Baghdad, here's Peter Arnett over there. CNN has uh, turned journalism upside down with that, something called a four-line phone. Uh, in the first night of the war, when Bernie Shaw and uh, Holloman and uh, Arnett were over there. Arnett is a hardball. He's really a, a serious war correspondent. He wouldn't leave. You know, so what? Kill me. I'm, uh, I'm here to cover it. But what it, CNN had done was uh, lie in a thing called a four-line phone. I called out to Atlanta right away saying, what the hell do you have? What kind of equipment? I want one of those. <laughs> and uh, Ed Turner, it's a, not Ted, but Ed is a news, uh, news president. First he said uh, he denied it, they had anything special. He said, I sent them 4,000 quarters. <laughs> nobody else could broadcast from Baghdad, but what they did was uh, send in a, what they called a four-line phone that you can walk around with, I have a cellular phone here somewhere. I was just driving, driving in the, down the road using it a minute ago, it's amazing. You can call anywhere. But what they had over there was a, a line where you have your own satellite, you are your own satellite, uplink. And everybody else had to wait for AT&T and lines and all that. But it's just a matter of equipment, about a half million dollars. And their little units, it costs about 50,000 a piece. You can walk around and broadcast straight up in the air. And uh, right back to Atlanta, it bounces. Technology. So that's uh, Peter Blystone in, uh, I think, Jerusalem, was uh, congratulating Arnett and those people being in Baghdad for having the only free coverage uh, everybody else was censored. It really is amazing the pictures of Arnett hunched over his goddamn little, you know, machine. Over the, uh, the sensor, the sensor is hidden behind it. Uh, they need, they need, uh, that machine. Their own, their own, their own uh, machinery is destroyed. So as long as Peter is there with that, uh, four-line phone, they're going to keep it, uh, working until somebody else figures out how to work it. <laughs> All right, I'm talking too much here. Uh, There's been criticism of Peter Arnett because he's been criticized as being a spokesman for the Iraqis. Um, <laughs> what's your opinion of that? Does Peter Arnett really know he's not telling the truth? Of course he knows he's not telling the truth, but what should he be there? Should he be I can't hear it. I can't see him. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, but you remember you asking, does he know? Does Peter Arnett, well, I detected a difference in the way he said things. Uh, he said things that were not true. Uh, he said things that were not true. 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 Well, Peter won a uh, Pulitzer Prize in Vietnam in, uh, I think, 67 or 68. He's, uh, he's pure as they, as they get as a, 
a journalist and a uh, they don't come any harder and any straighter than Peter. He doesn't, he's, you know, he's not a boozer. He's not a, he has no political opinions, but he is a, a story freak. He's a junkie. And if I had to have anybody over there to, uh, well, you need something. I don't, well, maybe we don't need anything. Maybe, would you prefer have to have no, we have to imagine here he's sitting there, the only, re only reporter allowed to stay there. Yeah, but it's a really a fine wire to walk. Uh, yeah, all once that little uh, bugger that sits behind him when he's talking learns how to operate the four-line phone, uh, Peter becomes expendable. So yeah, it's a it's really an amazing feat that he's doing, and I don't think uh, well you get into telling the truth. Uh, he's not lying about, uh, he would not do that to say that uh, the bombs fell here. He's not a uh, mouthpiece for uh, Saddam, but he is subject to things like, he was walking down the street and they got a beckoning uh, call, come in here and uh, have a little talk, you know, to, with the, uh, uh, the man here. He, he had, any time he even get his notebook, he was, plopped down in front of uh, his own camera and uh, for a two or three hour interview. Yeah, he's being used, but uh, Christ, the, uh, I don't think the reporters in uh, Riyadh and uh, around the, the people who go and hang out at uh, press tents and listen to generals talk to them are being uh, any less used. Peter, it's a, it's a weird situation. I, I don't recall any uh, anything like it in, in journalism or war, where he's our ear in this place. And yeah, sure, he's not sitting in there uh, denouncing the uh, Iraqis. It's amazing that they let him. They're, they are, yeah, sure, they're using him. They're getting, uh, I think Saddam is a, a, a serious uh, maniac in terms of. Uh, a very uh, a totally focused uh, believer, a true believer. And he believes that once his story is out and people understand him, that of course they'll agree. You know, of course the devil should be slain. He needs, uh, they blew up, we blew up his uh, uplinks, his AT&T lines. He has no communications in or out there. And he's, uh, yeah, CNN has given him one, and boy, it's uh, valuable. Uh, I'm surprised that he's as articulate and as calm as he appears to be. Are you? Uh, I was. I thought his whole manner changed from one day to the next. Which day? Oh, I mean, you're talking about Arnett. Well, when Bernie uh, Bern Shaw and uh, John Holloman left. I'm not sure how I'd feel. I would, uh, well, Baghdad's a better place to be than uh, covering the war from Saudi Arabia. At least you can get a beer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I would prefer to be where Arnett is than uh, where uh, these other, what's, what's the guy's name uh, from NBC? Kent? Arthur Kent? You see Arthur Kent from I mean, NBC with the bombs and the rockets? Yeah, it's, it's very frustrating to cover a war when you have to do it uh, second hand. At least Arnett is there. And uh, who knows? Here we, uh, these uh, rockets and uh, bombs strafing. Uh, if we've killed our own Marines, if, if all the American casualties so far have been uh, us killing our own people by accident, which they say is uh, you know, part of war, well, shit, nobody asked for the war in the first place. We invaded there. We, we, we bombed those people. Uh, that's the case. I'm not sure any, any, uh, at any moment. Or that could, uh, you know, uh, go to black, as they say. And then it's all, all over. You're, you know, kind of a weird shot, like, oh, God, uh, stand back, run, boom. And it's, uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, he won't be hit by one of those errant uh, tomahawk missiles. 42,000 bombing raids in uh, 
15 days. It seems like the war has been going on forever. It's only about two weeks. He guns. Wait till it starts. But, uh, okay.
Yeah, you couldn't uh, do any more to uh, go belly up in public than the Democrats did. <laughs> and, it, well, their ticket for 92 now, uh, the, among the party pros, these swine, these goddamn, uh, well, back alley uh, hacks who run the Democratic Party. And actually, they think it win everything except the presidency. They have all the state offices, I have Congress, the uh, state chairman, local kind of county caucus people, their job is secure. And they've abandoned the uh, White House. What do you think of Doug Wilder? Well, <laughs> as, uh, as governor or as a uh, candidate? I have to think about this. Well, compared to what? That's the, uh, I mean, serious now, uh, we're looking at a, uh, 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 an opposition party in a democracy You do need, uh, there has to be, there has to be, too, there has to be some competition. And the Democrats have given up. So Wilder as a uh, decoy, like uh, New Orleans was, well, at the party pros now, uh, the vetting is it'll be Benson, Lloyd Benson from Texas, that wretched, degenerate uh, crook. And, uh, and Jesse Jackson, who I like, I like Jesse. He's one of the few people around uh, in the Democratic Party who understands that politics really is the art of participating and controlling your uh, environment. Doug Wilder, uh, I like him. But he's not going to be president, he's not going to win. Let's give us some odds. Uh, it's on Wilder? Uh, yes. Well, let's see. We'll give you on Wilder uh, 800 to 1. No. <laughs> I'd give you uh, Jesse Jackson as president uh, pretty close to that. I, uh, I think the Democratic Party is, is bereft somehow of... Uh, I'm not, and they've got the point where they don't care anymore because they have all their jobs are secure and they've forgotten that in uh, our form of government it's a, uh, it's three heads. And if you give up the White House, you also give up the Supreme Court, as we have for uh, almost 16 years now. And a generation of politics is 20 years. And when you give up the Supreme Court, and uh, the White House is, uh, you can tie things up with Congress, you can lock it. <laughs> as the Republicans did with Kennedy. But you cannot, uh, when you, there are three branches of government. And the Supreme Court has slipped totally into one camp, whatever you think of it. And I'm not sure that uh, the Democrats really care. I think the Democrats are in the way. The whole party should be destroyed. Like the Whigs, they should quit. <laughs> because, yeah, they're, uh, well, they're in the way and in the, in that they're, uh, they're not competing. It's fixed. You know, it's like uh, Don King and Bob Arum and the heavyweight uh, you know, boxing. Uh, I would like to have an honest response, you know, competition. And I can't see that the Democrats, who would you like to see run for president? Uh, on, as a, you know, <laughs> be, I think he'd be the, he'd be the best president we would have, but he, I think he'd lose. I think Jesse Jackson would lose. Who has the best odds in your opinion? Probably goddamn Lloyd Benson. For being the candidate, not for being, I think the question will be reelected, unless the Democrats take, their, take themselves seriously as uh, equals in, uh, and they get, you know, if they don't want to compete, well, Gary Hart, of course, was, uh, well, Gary Hart was 16 points ahead of George Bush on the day that he uh, tripped over his dick and, uh, and lost. <laughs> yeah, Gary was, uh, he's a friend of mine, I like Gary, and, uh, he was a president. He was the closest thing we had to a president in waiting. That also happened, by the way, right down the road, uh, next door at Don Henley's house. Yeah, I was talking to Bill Dixon, uh, Gary's campaign manager, on the night that that uh, occurred, and he had one of these uh, call waiting things. We were talking about what Gary was going to do, who was going to be attorney general. Oh, Hal had you know, my lawyer. Everything was taken care of. 
16 points ahead. And I texted and said, oh, wait a minute, I have another call. I'll be right back. Oh, about five minutes later, he came back. Say, oh, Jesus Christ, oh, help. The Miami Herald is in this terrible story. They're going to run tomorrow. Blow, everything's blown up. Gary's uh, done for. Uh, yeah, the story for anybody, but it was so weird. Nobody would confirm it. I called the Miami Herald. I called CNN. Nobody knew about it. But, uh, yeah, the whole thing blew up. And Gary was the last honest challenger I think we had. Cuomo is, uh, what we call say, a reluctant uh, candidate. I think I like Cuomo. He's a good governor of New York. Well, he's, uh, he has the same kind of problems that uh, Jolene Ferraro had with uh, a family of uh, uh, people with dubious uh, checkered records, you know. Here, the Democrats with uh, a ran a woman who's husband at the time was running a gigantic porno operation film out of a star, star pornograph something. And uh, her son was busted for uh, what, selling speed, coke. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I don't think I'd uh, accept the nomination for uh, vice president or uh, they make a target of yourself. And that's what she did. And uh, Gary, as a death wish. But uh, Cuomo has the same kind of problem with his family. But I'm not sure. We've had crooks. Uh, look at Nixon. Uh, he's a, uh, as criminal a person as we've ever seen in this country, much less an elected president. And really, he, Richard Nixon is the uh, obverse of the American dream on the other side of the coin. Uh, like perfectly guilty. And he was president. Uh, Richard Nixon was elected in every office in the country except the governor of California. The congressman, senator, president, everything he ran for. Him. And he almost uh, won to California. That's when he, uh, when he lost. He uh, flipped out. That's when he said, uh, I quit, you bastards. That's it. You know, down the press. You won't have Richard Nixon to kick around anymore. Well, he lied then, too. He came back. <laughs> I miss Nixon. Yeah. Oregon Strug. Let's see. What has the Oregon Strug done? It's destroyed the Fourth Amendment. Uh, it's destroyed uh, almost all of our really constitutional rights, the Bill of Rights. The price of cocaine is now down to uh, I don't know, $1,200 a kilo or something. Uh, not quite. Uh, the war against drugs has been a total failure. It's like the uh, security programs that are coming from, uh, will come out of this war against uh, the infidel over here. Uh, now, the, the, uh, airport security, these, uh, these remember the metal detector, you know, those things. They were put in a, a few years ago because of uh, D.B. Cooper, you know, hijackers. People who uh, were trying to hustle bombs on a domestic flight. And it's a temporary measure, and they've never come home. It's like a tax, and no such thing as a uh, temporary tax will be removed. And it's easier in this country to uh, create emergencies, uh, to, uh, well, the government's easier, always, the government's always easier if people don't uh, argue with you, if they're afraid and quiet and satisfied. Here we have an economy that's uh, about to bottom out and go right through the bottom. Uh, a war that's cost what was the budget figure today? Uh, 1.4 trillion. Uh, was it? it was submitted. Uh, this is insane. It'd be like me uh, finding a bag of uh, jewels and cash on the railroad uh, tracks someday and uh, running a buck. Well, I, I do that. I have that kind of sense of money anyway, but I'm not in charge of the country. But we really are. Uh, a nation uh, spiraling in different directions, going sideways, wars, total debt. And it's better, uh, it's a fascistic concept to uh, create situations that keep people from arguing with you too much. And we pretty well suspended all of our uh, constitutional rights in terms of uh, our ability to argue, to fight back. 
And boy, I tell you, I went through it. I, uh, I got uh, my feet went right in the fire on that one. Uh, you can fight them, and you can beat them. The question was how much of fear and loathing is true, and how much is a product of your imagination? I believe the uh, statute of limitations uh, has expired on most of that. Yeah. Well, I'm going to tell you that about 90% of it is true, but I want you to appreciate that in this climate, in this country, to admit that 90% uh, of that's true, and to, uh, to say kind of wistfully that, uh, boy, I'd like to do that again, it was fun. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's a very dangerous thing to say. It's an attitude that uh, does not fit in with a, uh, we're in a lockstep you now. Uh, we you know, wave the flag, uh, defend our country, where uh, I wore this tonight, I thought you people would like it. Push, uh, well, they worked in Vietnam. Well, in Vietnam, you could uh, go wherever you wanted to. If you got killed, well, that was uh, part of the problem. But, uh, I don't know, it's, uh, it seems like we're heading for, with the war on drugs, uh, the war on uh, Saddam, uh, when it used to be the war on poverty, right? That's what's over. Uh, yeah, it used to be, the argument used to be, maybe we could, could have both guns and butter. Well, now uh, we've lost the butter, and we, uh, if we stay over there much longer past Ramadan, the, uh, Islamic uh, holy uh, day, uh, holy what, two weeks, three months? Ye God, can you imagine millions, millions of uh, pilgrims? Uh, and these are zealots, these are religious people who believe uh, there is no God but Allah. And uh, if you don't get to Mecca once a year, uh, your chances of going to uh, heaven uh, disintegrate or uh, get a little, get queasy, so they, they, they go there. And now we're gonna have, to, we're gonna have millions of pilgrims coming from Iran, from uh, all over the uh, whole Middle East, Shiite Muslims, uh, Sunni Muslims, going to Mecca, which is in Saudi Arabia, coming across the desert in these caravans. He, God, God, I don't know. Uh, one way to uh, distract uh, a people, a, a nation that is troubled internally has always been uh, dictators uh, to get in external wars and engage in huge building projects at home. But I think maybe we might have gone a little bit too far this time. That's what March 17th, and my advisor here, I can't uh, reveal her name. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, March 17th, yeah. So the war has to be over by March 17th, or uh, we're gonna end up bombing caravans of pilgrims who uh, don't give a flying fuck while we're there, except we're just in the way. I don't see, I don't, I, I'm not comfortable with the idea of, uh, I have guns in trouble with the IRS. I only pay, I, every three years I have trouble. And I, I don't cheat, I don't uh, argue, I don't pay for every three years. <laughs> You know, I filed, and I pay it a lot. But I'm not comfortable with the idea that I'm paying to have, uh, for more Tomahawk missiles, and more Mavericks, uh, to, to drop bombs on civilians. Uh, and that makes me feel, I'm very uncomfortable with it, that, that we're just saturation bombing uh, people who don't seem, uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, disturbed by the uh, Iraqis, the people, I, uh, the uh, scenes I, we had pictures out of Baghdad before the bombing started. They seem like interesting people to me. They have one of the, uh, the hugest uh, animal markets uh, in the world. It goes back something like 4,000 years. You can buy it, you can have, uh, furry bears, you know, parrots with three legs. Uh, they seem okay. It's a, they're not uh, 
I'd much rather live in uh, Baghdad than Saudi Arabia. At least uh, you can know, have a little fun. But I'm not comfortable even if I didn't like them. I wouldn't be comfortable with bombing the Saudis back to in the Stone Age. I don't like the idea of uh, that we, the uh, you know, the strongest and uh, you know freest and uh, you know, the most advanced uh, free-thinking nation in the history of the world, uh, carrying the torch for. Uh, you know, human development and uh, not uh, power and fascism and blood. We have been for that. Uh, Thomas Jefferson did not speak for uh, saturation bombing of uh, anybody, I don't think. And I'm, I'm embarrassed that that's all we have now to speak for the world and to history. Uh, with just in B-52s and bombing these people uh, Really, in the Stone Age, the idea is that we're, we're destroying. Uh, now that we've called him the devil, and well, how can we leave there if he's not destroyed? If the rock is not destroyed, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I don't like it. I, I feel uh, that there's something wrong with it. We, we've gotten sidetracked into being the. It's like Hitler in '37 when they. Uh, went into Spain to test their weapons. And in fact, I uh, went there and there's a, 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 not just a line of a theory, but in fact, that the weapons we were using over there are not gonna come back because it's too expensive to rotate the weapons. The troops can be rotated, that, that can be borne financially. The uh, tanks uh, are obsolete now because they were designed to fight the Russians in the Cold War. And we have no use for these things. So you wonder who's going to get them. <laughs> who's going to end up with those seven you know, million uh, Bradley fighting vehicles or those things explode on impact when they get a magnesium rocket. I hate to be in those. I don't know. Uh, well, I, I, clearly I'm uh, uncomfortable with, with being uh, representing an Asian paid my taxes for uh, missiles that blew up seven Marines by accident that uh, I don't really know or care that uh, Arnett's milk factory in uh, Baghdad was or was not a milk factory. If I were uh, Saddam, I would uh, start sending over uh, false chemical warheads. I'd put them uh, one out of ten. I'd put can you talk about her ammonia in uh, 9 out of 10? Send them uh, weird stuff that exploded on the uh, ground. And, uh, it seems like a, a kind of madness that once you get into it, you can't, uh, you can't win. Yeah, maybe heads on spikes. Uh, we have, and we have, in Kuwait, we have a martyrs brigade. 10,000 martyrs are people, alleged Kuwaitis. We need to go in there and uh, root people out. This seems like it, uh, going back to the days of Genghis Khan, you know, uh, yeah, when he went into cities, he would uh, give them uh, 24 hours to, uh, you know, give in. He didn't. And he would go in and pick up all the other uh, governor, family of all, anybody, you know, powerful merchants, politicians, and put them in the, uh, Main Street, lie them down and put rugs over them, cover them with rugs. And then, uh, while the rest of the citizens watched, he would send his cavalry charging down the Main Street over the rugs. And, uh, well, that seems sort of civilized compared to bombing people repeatedly. I don't maybe it's just me. How do you, how do you people feel about saturation bombing? That's the new uh, thinking, yeah. And I think Powell's very much for it. <laughs> Quill, uh, yeah, Quill, and uh, he's been on the on the news recently. You know, he's been up front for a change. I think you know, he'll be dumped probably. Uh, there's no reason to keep Quill. Uh, uh, 
ambitions. It's not so much with Baker about of ambition as uh, inevitability. But, uh, yeah, you look at uh, Baker and uh, Bell in 92. That'd be hard to beat. Hank Bush is, uh, I'm not sure how he can handle anything on uh, the economy and the war. But, so yeah, Baker, Colin Bell, Quayle will go back to playing golf in Indianapolis. Uh, uh, he, he was hopeful, I guess. It, it, it's hard to argue with the person who uh, blew the gender gap apart. Yeah, Bush, the, the, women, the women's vote, there was an uh, unshakable gender gap of 10 or 12 points uh, before Quayle was put on the ticket in New Orleans. And uh, everybody was horrified. I thought, good, good. This will sink up forever. This is perfect. This uh, shows what a party of dingbats and yuppies and freaks that they are. And lo and behold, Quayle actually pulled votes. And uh, it was embarrassing to a lot of people. You never heard anything about the gender gap again. Who, anybody here vote for Quayle? <laughs> Nobody voted. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like Agnew. Oh no, I, no, I, I never knew him. <laughs> <coughs> if you had to die, where would you want to go? To die? Yeah. You'd have to die or before? In order to die? Or? Where would you want to die? And what would you be doing? <laughs> well, <laughs> I hadn't thought about it too much, but uh, I wouldn't be in a hospital. Uh, yeah, we could go into this in some way. Uh, <laughs> well, shucks. Uh, well, uh, I suppose not knowing uh, about it would be a huge explosion of some sort, you know, something like that. Trying to adjust a bomb, sort of, you know, and get the views right here. Oh, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> Tap this. Don't worry. I, I told you. I never read the Underdog's cookbook. I know what I'm doing. Boom. <laughs> but uh, well, I like to die having uh, some fun. <laughs> okay, yeah, we're getting, there's a shortage of fun these days. That's what I feel it even now. Yeah, fun's getting real scarce. You can see it in people's faces. It's uh, withered up, and uh, it's not so much, not the death of, well, it's not so much a lack of fun as the fear that it's dead. You know, where were you when the fun stopped? That sort of thinking. Where's your hand? I can't. Uh, where are you? Where are you? Okay, yes. Well, I didn't do that, but, uh, <laughs> boy, uh, no, I, I didn't want to try and, uh, that really is setting yourself up for a serious bust. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, Kesey taught me, taught me a lot about fun a long time ago. Uh, yeah, I had about as much fun with Ken, Ken Kesey and his, uh, those people down La Honda, and, and it's still, Ken's one of the great people, uh, a good friend, and uh, really one of the uh, one of us, and uh, pretty limited in a way that very few people are. And uh, yeah, I had much fun as I've ever had in my life with uh, down at, with Ken Kesey. But uh, that was before uh, LSD was legal. Imagine that. And, <laughs> Is LSD use coming back? And when was the last time you tripped? <laughs> Well, tripped is kind of a atavistic word. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I like LSD. As a matter of fact, I used some last night, I think. But uh, <laughs> yeah, LSD, I used LSD is coming back, but not in the same way as uh, that blowout. You know, like, uh, let's get berserk. You know, it's uh, get to the point where we. Uh, I don't recognize you, and uh, you know, 
have to chain myself to the pipe in the basement. <laughs> I've always been, uh, I've always advocated uh, the social use of LSD as opposed to Leary, Jim Leary, who is, you know, the uh, guru, sort of, uh, the, the control setting, you know, the, uh, well, yeah, he wants to be, somebody has to direct the trip. I'm all for just eating uh, LSD and going out and, uh, you know, uh, the basketball game, or, uh, whatever. I don't know, let's say, uh, I don't have a gig that now. Well, so, so, you never, uh, well, I can only speak for myself, but no character is really uh, strictly based on one person. Uh, Kemp is more. Oh, yeah, I knew it. Oh, and uh, and Kemp. That was a little bit. That was a lot of myself. Yeah, at the time, I was very stylish to be. Uh, uh, well, that was the end of the sort of silent generation. I think you know the eyes of an error. So do I know? And if Shelby, excuse me, no, pardon me, Catherine here is, uh, is, uh, is right, then in a few years we're going to have a, a total eruption of uh, libertine madness. And uh, well, you can see the 60s coming. You feel you kind of feel the 60s coming. Uh, you know, as a child, like hot damn, you, can, you know, cool wind. And uh, it did. Uh, it did happen. And Kemp was sort of on the cusp of that. And uh, on the 50s and even the early 60s, the 60s did not happen until, oh, it was in the middle of the 60s. It really did happen. It started when uh, Kennedy uh, beat Nixon. What's your favorite firearm to shoot? And did you bring it with you tonight? Firearm? Yeah, what's your favorite firearm to shoot off? Well, boy, my favorite was uh, my uh, ancient German Schmeiser uh, machine gun. I was forced to cut it into four parts and pieces and, and send it into the uh, police. essentially as a roadman for the, uh, the boys upstairs. Uh, the great hall. But I, uh, yeah, I believe that, uh, yeah, we're gonna answer for uh, the way we uh, live. And uh, in the sense of the, uh, well, you have to get into reincarnation, which I haven't quite come to terms with yet, but, uh, the trouble with, uh, with karma, which I really I have a very firm belief in, you have to take it, and the Buddha says you have to take it into the next life. That's why when you get into arguments with uh, Vietnamese or uh, Orientals, uh, as we did in Vietnam, these people don't have it. it they're, we have, people say, well, they have no respect for uh, human life. Oh, it's bullshit. They just figure that if they get killed, uh, as I do in a way, I, 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 I welcome the rest, you know, a little rest before I have to come back. But some people are going to come back as evil rats. And, uh, yeah. Imagine what Richard Nixon, what kind of karma he is going to, uh, oh yeah, I, uh, yeah, the great, I don't uh, think St. Peter is a silly thing, the U.S. Marines guarding the goddamn Golden Streets, that's silly. But yeah, I believe that, uh, the Lords of Karma are up there, and uh, you will come back uh, based on uh, what you deserve. And the constant, uh, yeah, not a total, yeah, total death. I'm not sure just uh, how that works with souls and things, but yeah, I believe that, uh, yeah, I was 
probably here once before in some other form, and uh, I will be again. I'm pretty comfortable that I'm not going to be sent back as a, uh, a three-legged dung rat, you know, a dung beetle in Calcutta. But uh, <laughs> we're not wearing Pat McKinnon's campaign down there, but I threatened McKinnon with me having to come back as a rat in Calcutta being chased through the streets. And yeah, I think some people are going to really, uh, uh, not so much answer, but uh, I don't know. You're, you're, I would, would you be happy coming back as you are now, or would you, uh, what would you like to come back as? As a human being, or uh, I'd like to come back as a dolphin, I think. <laughs> Oh, on occasion, on occasion, yeah. Uh, I'm supposed to go to Moscow and uh, just explain what's happening in the Soviet Union for Rolling Stone pretty soon. That's an interesting place, so I tell you that. Uh, here. Yeah, yeah, you can say that. Uh, you know, winners become immensely uh, wealthy. I, I warned him all along that that's going to happen. And I also warned him that he's going to have to answer. Uh, <laughs> the, the wheel, the work when the great wheel turns. And uh, he ain't going to come back as the editor of Rolling Stone. <laughs> He'd probably come back as a, uh, yeah, well, Patrick has uh, done pretty well. He's not going to come back uh, as a presidential advisor for through four or five terms of crooked, incompetent, uh, warmongers and bunglers. Yeah, Patrick, ever since 1964, he's written his speeches for Agno, for Nixon. Uh, he's taught Reagan how to lie, and Bush even how to lie to the press. Patrick is good. I like him. He's, a, uh, he's not much fun to, uh, to drink beer with as anybody in Washington. But Patrick would have me put in the, underneath the prison somewhere. I'm comfortable. Patrick is, uh, he'll get his. <laughs> He goes to see the Lords of Karma. But I like the kind of, he's a, in these terms, he should be, a, he should run for president. As he is, I think. He's always wanted to be president. Yeah, he's a, uh, he's a feisty, uh, one of the smartest people I've run into in politics. You have to have some fun. That's a horrible monster, boy. <laughs> Really, that is. That's a troll. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's sort of a one and a half dimensional person with immense power. My person. Well, that's what I've been getting at for a while here. Uh, <laughs> advice. Well, what would, you, what would you like to do? I mean, you tell me what you'd like to do, and I'll maybe put some odds on it for you. What would you do if you went to school asked, uh, what would you do if you went to a school, I don't know, one exists, where you could get kicked out for breaking a window? <laughs> well, it all depends on your point of view. Uh, I recall in high school, uh, I think I was expelled from uh, high school for rape or something like that. <laughs> I gotta say that now, it's funny, but it wasn't done. Well, uh, uh, while I was on suspension or whatever, I uh, a few friends and I uh, robbed a uh, beer depot, got a case of beer, and went out in front of the school to pretend its house. I remember standing there in the, the colonial house with these uh, kind of white windows and small, you know, frames, eight by twelve, whatever. And we threw every beer bottle full through the windows into the house, one after another, for about fifteen minutes it seemed, <laughs> <laughs> and then fled. Yeah, each one was like a hand grenade out of the night. 
whole case. And uh, I don't know uh, how that fits with your personal situation. <laughs> well, the 49ers. But when well, I suffered through the, uh, the bad years of the 49ers, I had a uh, season ticket for in the years when they were whipped like dogs by everybody in the league. <laughs> and he's our stadium. So I, uh, yeah, that's a karmic thing. I deserved that belt. Yeah, victory years. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, I really still can't imagine how the Giants beat them, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the question is, does Dr. Thompson think marijuana will be legal again, and how effective a lobby is normal? Well, we were very effective for a while there. I was the director of normal when we uh, effectively uh, decriminalized it. Uh, since then, there's been a, what you call a rollback in the uh, law. And, oh yeah, it's, uh, even though, uh, prison for four or five years now in a lot of states for possession of uh, oh, three or four ounces of pens. It's really the discretion of the, uh, uh, the law. And we've, no, we've lost uh, badly on the marijuana. Uh, it should be legal. Have you tried now? I tried, yeah. I did it uh, for I had a good growing situation, but boy, you have to pay a lot of attention. And if cows don't get it, the goddamn neighbor's kids will. <laughs> yeah, if you're growing marijuana uh, these days, I mean, you're, when you're selling it for $3,000 a pound, it's a full-time job. Well, it is the largest uh, cash crop in about five states, Kentucky, Missouri, California. Third, Third here? Well, oh, they uh, have to finance a war. Why not finance it off marijuana tax? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, anybody here uh, know people who've been ruined and savaged by, uh, you know, reefer madness or smoking weed? I think it's a, uh, it could be a very productive uh, part of uh, our world. It certainly is now. <coughs> And the reason is it costs three thousand a pound, and it offends weed brutally. I used to buy weed for, you know, uh, fifty dollars, thirty dollars a lid, you know, a little bit of And uh, it's become a designer drug. You know, cocaine is cheaper than marijuana uh, on the street. Is that true? I'm not sure what the situation is here. <laughs> Yeah, I, I came across the other thing. I, I got my hands on it for the first time, and I don't know, a few years, what they used to call a donkey dick. You know, a, a huge, beautiful butt. Uh, a stem. And that's stuff they used to have at high times. You know, you compare. That's pretty hard to come by these days. Yeah, it really, uh, I gently, crazily stoned on the really good weed. It's a, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Explain your current legal situation. No, that was not it, right? Hell, that's a question. <laughs> yeah. I, I just said the same thing. I just want to make sure we get it around. How, how, did, you, how did you manage to get out of your recent legal battle? I should say, you turned out to be president. You got off the charges dropped. We beat them like dogs. <laughs> Yeah, how did he manage to get out? Yeah, how did he manage to get out?
to get out of his recent legal situation. This is a very uh, a key question, uh, not only in my life, but uh, perhaps in yours. <laughs> now, well, nobody is immune uh, from the kind of police power that comes with ignoring the Fourth Amendment. And uh, there has to be some constraints on the police uh, to keep them from, uh, well, the current buzzword, buzz phrase in law enforcement is uh, trying to bring people within the system. And that's what they were trying to do with me. They offered me, uh, I could plead guilty to one, well, I was charged with first, like, 37 felonies. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, uh, I haven't had that much fun in a long time. <laughs> but I, yeah, <laughs> Gail Palmer Slater, yes. I remember her in my house that night saying, I can't go home like this, I'm too sloshed. My husband's never seen me like this. He doesn't know about my background. And I said, well, babe, you're, he's about to, you know. <laughs> yeah, she had married a year, uh, Ago, the team doctor of the Detroit Red Wings, an eye doctor, an ophthalmologist, who was outraged, of course, that he what, flogged his wife and uh, twisted her nipples and put a gun to her head. <laughs> well, then that's true, but uh, I did get tired of her in my house, yeah. <laughs> and I uh, tried to call a cab. If the cab had come in time, uh, it would have happened. But, to paint that, that was really a, a setup and a, a kind of a bad joke, which even uh, Gail uh, came around to understanding and uh, she blew the, the, their case out of the water. There's an old saying in the law that uh, not even God can win a preliminary hearing. Uh, that's when they just did, they look at the charges and see if there's any possible uh, weight to them. And then they bind you over for uh, trial. And uh, yeah, usually you know, most lawyer, lawyers give up. But I remember that Lee Trevino had said once that not even God could get a one iron. That's after he'd uh, been uh, hit by lightning. But he had, uh, God, God had missed him with the lightning. Uh, he had his one iron up in the air. It's a bad joke. But I could get a one iron. And, uh, I thought maybe we win this preliminary hearing. So we got Gail in there uh, out of uh, some wild notion. I had my lawyer go there and ask for a date up in Michigan. And she's a weird woman, a lascivious woman. She sent me uh, two porno pages of herself and a weird uh, note in the Hallmark card, as it turned out. The, the front page said, the front page said, uh, sex is a dirty business. Then you opened it up and, and said, but somebody has to do it. And, uh, all kind of lewd suggestions about what we were going to do when she came out to uh, Aspen with her uh, husband for the, uh, the eye doctor's convention. <laughs> and, uh, well, yeah, she came to the uh, preliminary hearing. Oh, well, what I answer your question very uh, uh, in a nut. I decided that uh, I couldn't afford to bargain with this one. I couldn't afford to plead uh, anything. Uh, they wanted me within the system, which means on probation. Uh, the, the current mindset of law enforcement is that it, we're, we'd all be better off if everybody's on probation. And uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't survive permanent probation. It'd be silly. So we, uh, I decided to take it on full bore. And uh, I uh, reached back into my karmic uh, past to the time when I was uh, on the board of directors of Normal, when we got, uh, we decriminalized and came up with Jerry Goldstein, uh, the uh, recognized authority on uh, search and seizure in the country you now. And with Hal Hatton, who was uh, Gary Hart's campaign manager for uh, many years and many campaigns. Serious criminal, they aren't called criminal lawyers for nothing. Well, these are, you have warriors and you can, uh, you can beat them. It, uh, you have to take a, a certain risk. Once I'd, uh, they'd offered me 
a chance to plead. And on probation, you know, supervised probation, busy and bottled. Anytime you want to come in the house and rip it apart, they could. Uh, most people do that. Most people have to. It's very hard to fight, uh, to take them on in, in a war like that. Which is why now, I, I don't want to say I, but we have formed a Fourth Amendment foundation. And uh, I had the luck and the karma and the uh, friends. The people, uh, there was an assumption that this was as rich and powerful like the witness. It wasn't that at all. I, uh, I still haven't paid the bill. And uh, the, they're not prepared these days. Most people plead guilty just to get out of it, you know, out of it. You have to, to uh, take them on and tell them, fuck you, uh, you're guilty. And uh, boy, we did that. I had those bastards investigate it, raked over the coals, put on, uh, you know, put on special uh, prosecutors. I have a $22 million suit pending, uh, civil suit for invading my privacy. Uh, it took a full more effort. We had to go to war. And very few people can afford to do that. I don't have the, uh, either the money or the uh, access to uh, the kind of lawyers who can do that. But, uh, you know, Normal Connections, uh, Keith Stroop, who was then the executive director of Normal, is now the executive director of a thing called the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, a very high-powered group. And they offered me their services, which is like having a, a I'm not sure what to compare it to, but having your own army, your own uh, Green Marines, or, uh, Republican Guard, whatever. And because of that, I won, yeah. But I uh, had people who understood that it wasn't so much, whether, the question was not whether I was guilty of what twisting people's nipples or uh, having 0.09 uh, of a gram of, mar of, of cocaine in my house or 39 hits of acid. I told them, for fuck's sake, if I had, if I'd known the acid was here, if I possessed it, I'd eaten it. It wouldn't be here. <laughs> but, no, you can't, uh, I learned that you can't fight them uh, by your rules. You have to uh, take their rules and beat them to death with them, which is what we did. And by crossing uh, the uh, NECDL, this network of lawyers, I realized we had these lawyers in place, and they've agreed now to uh, take on Fourth Amendment cases. I think it's very important to beat these people, uh, to beat them in courts because the Supreme Court is not going to, uh, I've become a real expert on uh, criminal law. You get a real education when you're looking at 16 years in prison if you don't uh, figure it out. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna take on some cases. Uh, anybody, anybody here has been busted recently for search and seizure uh, or by illegal search and seizure? Uh, Lean on, stomped on. I mean, people, that happens to people every day uh, all over the country who can't afford to uh, shake their fist uh, at sort of uh, I was dealing with, with stupid white trash back alley fucking dumb cops. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's gone. It's gone. And uh, it, you have to, it takes a certain mindset to uh, take that attitude in public and say picture of death. Uh, I will dance on your head, you pig. You know, today's pig is tomorrow's bacon. You're kind of out on a limb. But with lawyers, uh, that it, these people from the, uh, all over the country, network of uh, the NACDO criminal lawyers have agreed to take these cases for nothing. If we, we have to find the right cases, I think it's important to win a few, just to show them that uh, they can't uh, just walk over people. Not everybody belongs within the system. There's no reason why we should be afraid uh, of local uh, law enforcement people. That's why they wear badges. And, and having a badge uh, is no license to stomp over anybody who uh, happens to want to smoke a marijuana joint. I'm not in favor of uh, violent crime. I'm not in favor of uh, any kind of crimes that uh, hurt other people. But I'll be goddamned if I'm going to sit around in a situation where any time uh, some thug and a uh, assistant DA's office decides that I'm a good uh, ticket to uh, little publicity 
in the war, you know, the war on drugs. Well, let's get dumped. With. He's uh, always guilty. Well, yeah. But uh, that doesn't give him the right to kick down. I'd come in my, and search my house for 11 hours, those bastards. Uh, they paid for it. And uh, there are ways to beat them, and uh, we've set up this network. Uh, you mentioned McGovern, George McGovern's on the board. Uh, we have some of the top lawyers in the country on the board of this Fourth Amendment thing. And uh, I want to take on some serious cases. Or, uh, yeah, my innocence or guilt. Yeah, of course they found what, uh, scrapings of, uh, of cocaine, and acid, and marijuana, dynamite, uh, whatever. You know, I use those things. <laughs> but they have the right to come in any time they want to and search my house and bust me for it. I live in the same. I've lived in the same house for 24 years. Of course I have. Every lunatic in the world, uh, Roscoe Acosta, who uh, Gordon Liddy, has been around there leaving. Bombs and done. That's not a crime. And it's not a crime to, uh, the, uh, well, to be an outlaw is different from being a cripple, I think. And to be busted for uh, a lifestyle, for an attitude, is, and to fear it, you have to fear it all the time, it really does change your life. It, it is like being on probation. So I thought we'd uh, bash our teeth up and on for, uh, because we uh, had the uh, warriors, I had, the, I had generals, and very few people knew, and it, uh, very few people could afford it, but with a, this Fourth Amendment Foundation, we have made it possible to beat them in the uh, state courts, district courts. Uh, the Colorado Supreme Court, for instance, is a much more liberal court Incredibly, than the U.S. Supreme Court, and there, there, there is a uh, ammunition. There are ways to uh, and, and keep at least a balance of terror. They don't like to get uh, humiliated, flogged, and have to answer for uh, to stand up and be uh, cross-examined for three weeks and have their. I had the DA's budget cut when that son of a bitch came in and asked for a raise after uh, into this. And yeah, politics. Uh, politics is the art of controlling your environment. And I realized uh, when this happened that I had, had paid attention to politics. All right, well, I mean, yeah, I'm just cut off here, but I may uh, just close with an uh, idea that uh, uh, liberty, freedom, it's really, uh, you know, all you have is really what you're willing to fight for. And if anybody goes out here tonight and uh, murders a child, that should go to prison. But uh, if we're into a situation where between the war on drugs and the war on uh, this dingbat over in uh, Persia, in the Gulf, I don't, generally it's not much of a percentage of uh, getting into war where uh, the first casualty is the whole Persian Gulf. It's an oil slick forever. Uh, that's no excuse to, uh, make us walk uh, on one leg through airports and constantly apologize for everything we uh, feel like uh, is our, our right to do. Our, uh, I have a right to live the way I uh, want to, I think. And uh, if I hurt other people, that's a different question. But just because I, people disagree with me, because cops don't think it's uh, fashionable, uh, is no reason that I should be in prison. And they should They should be in prison. That's my attitude. And uh, it's very important to fight them. And it's very important to, uh, to know that you can fight them. Because I think we were, after 20 years of uh, Christ, Reagan, Bush, uh, and Nixon's shadow was still there. After all this time, it's, it's really hard to believe that you can fight and you can beat City Hall. And it's fun. <laughs> so let me leave you with that. Uh, the night is not so dark. Oh God, they gave me the last page. Some, for some reason I agreed to take, I have an office in New York and that's where I know, and the back page. But uh, I don't know, that was a, sort of an accident. I, it was a letter to my agent. 
I know in the process of negotiating huge contracts, how the hell it turned up on the back page of Esquire, I don't know. I must have missed the deadline. <laughs> Thank you.